Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 7, Infectious Disease. This is video number 5, and in this video we're going to talk through Koch's postulates. So fortunately, now that we're looking at our learning intentions with not quite such a lot of uh, wordage on the page, we, we're now trying to look at um, how we can investigate the work of Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur to explain the causes and transmission of infectious disease. And in this video, we're going to focus on Koch. So what we need you to do is to be able to state Koch's postulates, to be able to explain them, and also to um, to be able to apply them to link a pathogen to a disease. And that is really the purpose of Koch's postulates. So let's have a look. So just as a little bit of background for you, during the second half of the 19th century, the work of Pasteur and Koch stimulated the search for microbes as causes of disease. A lot of work was done around this time and our knowledge of microbes and also the relationship between microbes and disease started to grow. This is also, you may remember, a time when we were starting to uh, improve our technology as far as microscopes are concerned. So we were starting to, um, uh, this was a really good time in history for us to start getting making really significant advances in our knowledge uh, of infectious disease. Now, Robert Koch was a German doctor and he was working on finding the link between particular diseases and a particular or microorganism. So he was trying to link together the disease with the cause. And this was new when uh, Koch was looking at it. Particularly, he was looking at the uh, tubercle bacillus in cattle which was um, the, supposed to be responsible for tuberculosis in cattle, which could also then be transmitted to humans. So what he was trying to do is to see if he could find the link between the bacteria and the disease. And we now have his postulates, which are what we use in order to try and specifically isolate the pathogen that causes a specific disease. So Robert Koch's work was in was critically important in uh, an, a very, very important step in our battle against infectious disease. What did he do? What, what, what were the significant things that he did? Well, one of the things that he did, uh, he was, uh, like we've talked about Mendel before, quite meticulous, and therefore when he was carrying out his experiments, we were able to see some very clear steps in the process that Koch took in order for him to come to the conclusions that he did. So the first thing he, he noticed was that the healthy cattle didn't have this particular bacteria, this bacillus. Uh, bacillus are the rod-shaped bacteria, and uh, so that's what he was looking for. And so by examining healthy cattle, he noticed that these particular individuals did not have the bacillus, but that those who had contracted the disease did have the bacillus. So, so first of all, he said it's absent from the healthy individuals, is present in the diseased individuals. So what he then did was um, he took some blood, and of course this is, uh, has very significant implications if we do this in humans. Uh, same sort of thing that we'll be talking about with some of the uh, work that uh, Edward Jenner did as well in his um, work in identifying a vaccination against smallpox. But what uh, Koch found was that blood from infected cattle, if it was injected into healthy cattle, it caused the disease. So the particular organisms that were only found in these diseased uh, individuals, if you extracted them and then uh, injected them into a healthy individual or, or a previously healthy individual, it would then develop the disease. So obviously he's starting to look now at the link, and that is uh, what... Uh, Koch's work was all about trying to find the link between the pathogen and the disease. And then he took pure cultures. So he took a pure culture of the particular bacillus that he was interested in. He injected it into healthy cattle and he found it too caused the disease. So he could take blood, but he could also take that blood, build up pure cultures and then uh, use those pure cultures. And again, he found in both cases the particular, the presence of that particular bacillus was, or at least seemed to be, um, associated with the development of the disease. What has happened as a consequence is that we have what we now call Koch's postulates. And uh, these are very, very important series of four steps that we go through if we're trying to link a particular pathogen with a particular infectious disease. You can think of them as a set of rules 
for deciding whether a particular disease is caused by a particular microorganism. But one of the important things is we need four ticks to our four rules. So we do one, and if we get a tick, then we do two, and if we get a tick, then we do three, if we get a tick, then we do four. If we get a cross at one, we stop. If we get to three and then we get a cross, we stop. So we know that there is a particular sequence that we're going to follow through here for Koch's postulates. And if at any point the, in the process it breaks down, something isn't doing what we expected to do, then we have to conclude that whatever it was that we thought might have been the pathogen is not the cause of the disease where we're looking at and studying. What are they? Well, uh, Koch also studied the disease anthrax in sheep, and he found that the microbe that was believed to cause the disease was always present when the disease occurred. So just like the tubercle bacteria in uh, the cattle, he noticed that for anthrax, every time he found individuals who had the disease, they had the microbe present. So this is the first, this became the first step. And in fact, what I, what I will do in the last of these slides is give you a um, shorthand version of Koch's postulates, which I think is really helpful for you. It's the four C's. So the first C is common. So the first thing you have to do is you have to see if all of the diseased individuals have the microbe. Now just one has to have this disease and not have the microbe present and then you have to conclude the microbe's not causing it. It's, it must be something else or at least the one that you thought was causing it isn't causing the disease. And that's why I said earlier that we can only have one failure and then we just stop. But if we find that all of, the uh, all of the individuals that have the disease also have the microbe present, then we get a tick for step one and we move on. What we do next is we isolate the individual from an infected host or patient. So we, what we want to try and do is to grow this up in a pure culture. So you can see, I guess, where the second C is coming from, and that is culture. So we don't want to get to the point where we just start injecting blood from an infected individual into a healthy individual because we don't know what's in the blood. Um, we, we know or at least we assume that the microbe might be there. We can even take samples and look at it and see whether or not the microbe is there. But the bottom line is there could also be other things that we're not aware of. So what we want to try and do is remove any other garbage, remove any other... Um, microbes, anything else that might potentially cause this disease, focus in on the specific microbe that we're interested in and grow it up in a pure culture. Then the controversial step. So what we need to do is we need to inject that into a healthy individual. And of course, what has to happen is that healthy individual needs to get sick. We must cause the disease. And that's going to be step three. So it's common, we isolate it, grow it in a pure culture, we inject it into a healthy individual, and obviously we don't do one because one is a very poor sample size and not very good science. So we inject it into a number, population of healthy individuals. We find it causes the same disease, not a variation, but the same disease that we're looking at. So anthrax in this particular case. And then what we do is we take the microbe, so basically we take a sample from our newly infected population and we culture it again. And when we culture it again, what we want to do is compare the two cultures. So we're going to compare the culture with the one that we had originally. We don't want it to mutate. We don't want it to have turned into something different that we um, didn't know was there in the first place. And this is our checklist of tick, 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 tick. If you pass all four tests, then you followed Koch's postulates to say this particular bacterium has caused this particular disease. And that's how Koch's postulates work. As I said, the key to this is the four C's, common, culture, cause, compare. If you can remember the four C's and apply the four C's to any situation, basically, where we suspect that a particular microbe might cause a particular disease and, and work through making sure that you get a yes for each of these. So you need to know what the positive test is at each step. So these four rules we can reduce down into just common. Is it common to all individuals? Culture. Can we grow it in a pure culture? 
cause? If we inject it into healthy individuals, does it cause the same disease? And compare. If we culture the microbe from those new uh, healthy individuals that then develop the disease and we compare our culture with our, our original culture. So the compare is a new culture with the original culture. Does, um, do, are they the same? And then if that, that is the case, then we can conclude that the pathogen, so the conclusion, if all the tests are positive, is that pathogen identified is the cause of disease. That's Koch's postulates. And we'll give you a chance to look at some examples in class. Thanks for watching.